Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Today, inshallah, we're going to solve Cambridge exam, May, June 2024, paper 62. Let's start it. Question 1. When a mixture of calcium hydroxide and ammonium chloride is heated, ammonia gas is made. As we can see from the equation, calcium hydroxide reacts with ammonia chloride to form calcium chloride water and ammonia gas. Ammonia gas is soluble in water and it is toxic. Ammonia gas react with hot copper 2 oxide to make nitrogen gas. So here, first, we will react calcium hydroxide and ammonium chloride to produce ammonia. Then we will react ammonia with copper 2 oxide to produce nitrogen. A uh, student make nitrogen using the apparatus shown here, here in the first part. We will react calcium hydroxide with ammonium chloride to produce ammonia gas. Then ammonia gas will pass over the copper 2 oxide to produce nitrogen and nitrogen gas will be collected here. First, name the items of apparatus labeled A and B. As we can see, A is a boiling tube where we heat the first mixture and B is the measuring cylinder where we collect nitrogen gas. Second, the apparatus need to be heated into two places. Draw arrows in two places to show where the apparatus should be heated during the experiment. It is already mentioned in the question that we will heat the mixture of calcium hydroxide and ammonium chloride. So we will draw arrow here to heat the mixture. This is the first arrow. Second, ammonia gas is reacted with hot copper 2 oxide, so we have to heat the copper 2 oxide. We will draw another arrow here. Here are the two arrows where uh, the apparatus should be heated. During the reaction, a colorless liquid collected at the point marked X suggests the identity of this liquid. Here, the point X, as we can see, it is a liquid formed from the reaction of calcium hydroxide and ammonium chloride. From the first equation here, we see the liquid is water. So the identity of this liquid is water. Some of the ammonia gas passes over the copper 2 oxide without reacting. So ammonia gas, not all ammonia gas react with copper 2 oxide. We have unreacted ammonia. None of this ammonia gas is collected in the item labeled B. So here, when ammonia gas passes over the copper 2 oxide, not all of the ammonia gas reacted. Why ammonia gas is not collected in the measuring cylinder B? Because ammonia gas is very soluble in water, so it will dissolve in water here in the measuring cylinder, and it, it will not be collected with nitrogen. It will dissolve in The student doesn't collect the first few bubbles of gas, suggests why the first few bubbles of gas are not collected. Of course, the uh, air present in the boiling tube and the delivery tubes collected first. So the first few bubbles will be collected here air is from the air present in the two boiling tubes and in the delivery tube. It is not nitrogen, it is air. That's why the student will not collect the first few bubbles. Explain why this experiment should be carried in a fume cupboard. It is mentioned at the top of the question that ammonia gas is toxic and for any experiment that produces toxic gas, it has to be done in fume cupboard. Question 2. A student investigate the reaction between aqueous aluminium chloride and two aqueous solutions of sodium hydroxide, solution F and solution G. So both solution F and G are sodium hydroxide, but they have different concentrations. So we will make the reaction between aluminium, aluminium chloride and sodium hydroxide. We will put aluminium chloride in the purette and sodium hydroxide in the conical flask. First, we will rinse the burette with distilled water. Then we will rinse it with aluminium chloride. We will fill the burette with aluminium chloride and run some of the solution from the burette. So the level of aluminium chloride will be uh, on the purette scale and we will record the initial reading of aluminium chloride solution. Then we will rinse the conical flask only with distilled water and use the measuring cylinder to measure 25 centimeter cube of solution F into the conical flask. We will stand the conical flask on a black or dark colored sheet of paper and start adding aluminium chloride from the purette 
until the solution just becomes cloudy. Then record the final burette reading of aluminum chloride solution. This is experiment one done with solution F. Then we will go to experiment two. We will refill the burette with aqueous aluminum chloride, then run of uh, some of the solution of aluminum chloride from the burette. Again, we will record the burette reading. We will rinse the conical flask with distilled water and we will rinse the measuring cylinder with distilled water. Then we will rinse it with solution G. Use the measuring cylinder. We will put 25 centimeter cube of solution G into the conical flask. Again, we will stand the conical flask on a black or dark color sheet of paper and we will slowly add aluminum chloride from the burette until the solution just start become cloudy and record the final burette reading. In experiment three, we will repeat experiment two again using aluminum chloride from uh, the burette and solution G in the conical flask. So we'll use the measuring cylinder again to measure 25 centimeter cube of solution G, put it in the conical flask, and we will put aluminum chloride in the burette and record the initial reading. But the only difference here is that we will add five drops of thymulphethalene indicator in the conical flask. And at this time, we will stand the conical flask on a white tile. Slowly add aluminum chloride from the burette to the conical flask while swirling the flask until thymulphethalene indicator change in color. Here we will record the final reading of aluminum chloride solution used. Here we have uh, the initial and final burette reading for the three experiments. The uh, first experiment one, the initial reading was 1.3 cm cube, the final reading 14.7. And for experiment two, the initial reading was 2.7 and the final reading was 29.5. For experiment three, the initial reading was 0.4 and the final reading was exactly 0.8. At each experiment, we will calculate the volume of aluminum chloride solution used by subtracting the final reading minus the initial reading. So in experiment one, we have 13.4 centimeter cube used and in experiment two, 26.8 centimeter. Finally, in experiment three, 27.8 six centimeter cube. In experiment three, the aqueous sodium hydroxide in the conical flask is alkaline. At the end point, the mixture in the flask is no longer alkaline. So state the color change at the end point of experiment three. We have thymulphethalene indicator, which is blue in alkaline media and at the end of the reaction the solution no longer alkaline so it is neutral that's why the thymulphysaline will change to colorless so the color change will be from blue to colorless state why the conical flask is swirled as the solution f is added in experiment one we swirl the flask of course to max the reactant so just why the conical flask is placed on black or dark colored paper in experiment one and two, as it is mentioned, the, uh, the color of the flask will change to be cloudy. That means it is white and the white color or the white precipitate is much easier to see on a black background or a dark colored paper. So we will use dark colored paper for the white precipitate to be easier to see. Explain why the measuring cylinder is rinsed between experiment one and experiment two. The measuring cylinder, of course, is uh, rinsed with water to remove solution F or to clean the measuring cylinder from solution F of the first experiment. Why the measuring cylinder doesn't need to rinse between experiment two and experiment three? Because in experiment three, we use the same solution, which is solution G used in uh, experiment two. So we, we uh, use the same solution G in both experiments two and three. So no need to rinse the measuring cylinder. Compare the concentration of solution F used in experiment one and the concentration of solution G used in experiment two. So we will compare the uh, volume of aluminum chloride used in experiment one and experiment two. Here in the table, we can find that we use 
double the volume of aluminium chloride in experiment 2 than in experiment 1. So solution G used in experiment 2 is double the concentration of solution F. You have to explain your answer. So solution G is more concentrated. Actually, it is double or twice the concentration of solution F because we use twice the volume of aluminium chloride in uh, experiment with solution G. Calculate the volume of aqueous aluminium chloride required when experiment 1 is carried with 10 cm3 of aqueous sodium hydroxide instead of 25 cm. In experiment 1, we use 13.4 cm3 of aluminium chloride when we use 25 cm of sodium hydroxide. So if we use 10 instead of 25, we will do cross multiplication to know the volume of aluminium chloride used. It will be only 5.36 cm3. In all the three experiments, it is more accurate to measure the volume of aqueous sodium hydroxide using volumetric pipette instead of measuring cylinder. Explain why it is not possible to use a volumetric pipette to measure the volume of aqueous aluminium chloride in this experiment. Of course, because the uh, volume of aluminium chloride is not fixed and pipette can measure only fixed volume, it cannot measure variable volumes, so it, can be, it cannot be used to measure aluminium chloride because the volume of aluminium chloride is not fixed. Question 3. A student tests two substances, solid H and solution I. Solid H is barium carbonate. Complete expected observation for testing solid H. The student add excess dilute nitric acid to the sample of solid H in a boiling tube and test any gas produced. Of course, when barium carbonate reacts with nitric acid, it produces carbon dioxide gas. So. Uh, the observation will be fizzing of a gas and we will test for the gas produced. The gas is carbon dioxide, so it will turn lime water milky. So my observation will be fizzing of a gas that turns lime water milky. Identify the gas. The gas is carbon dioxide. Any carbonate react with acid. Here we add nitric acid. Any carbonate react with acid to produce carbon dioxide gas that turns lime water milky. So of course the gas is carbon dioxide. The solution produced in AI is solution G. The student divides solution G into four equal portions. So first we have to know what is solution G. So when barium carbonate react with nitric acid we will have solution of barium nitrate and carbon dioxide gas produced in water. So the solution G produced from the first experiment is barium nitrate. The, the student divide solution J into four equal portion. First, we will carry out flame test on the first portion. We have barium ion and the color of barium in the flame is light green flame. To the second portion of solution J, the student add few drops of acidified aqueous potassium manganate. The acidified potassium manganate is used to test for sulfide ion, and here we don't have sulfide ion. Solution J is barium nitrate, so the answer will be, or the observation will be, no change. The solution of potassium manganate will remain purple. To the third portion of solution J, the student add few drops of dilute sulfuric acid. Of course, we have barium ions and sulfuric acid will react with barium ion to produce barium sulfate. So the observation will be white precipitate. Of course, this white precipitate is barium sulfate because the sulfate ions will react with barium ions to form barium sulfate. To the fourth portion of the solution, the student add one centimeter depth of dilute nitric acid followed by aqueous solution of barium nitrate. There will be no change because we have already barium nitrate. The solution J is barium nitrate, so there will be no reaction and no change. Then test on solution I shows uh, the table shows the test of the student and the student observation on solution I. 
the first test. To the first portion of solution I in a boiling tube, add sodium hydroxide and warm the mixture. Test for any gas produced. A damp, a gas which changed damp red litmus paper to blue. This is a test for ammonium ions. And the gas produced, of course, is ammonia gas, which is alkaline gas, change damp red litmus paper to blue. The second portion of solution I in a boiling tube, and we will add nitric acid followed by silver nitrate. We will have a white precipitate form. This is the test for halide ions, and the white precipitate form it indicates that the ion is chloride ion. So here we have ammonium ions and chloride ion. Of course, solution I is ammonium chloride. So identify the gas form it in test one. The gas is ammonia gas. And state what is observed when the gas produced in test one is tested using damp blue litmus paper. Of course, when you add ammonia to blue litmus paper, there will be no change. The blue litmus paper will remain blue. Solution uh, I, as we've just said, it is ammonium chloride. It contains ammonium ion and chloride ion, so the solution is ammonium chloride. Then, question four. Bismuth is a metal that has a reactivity similar to copper. So this is the first information. Bismuth have similar reactivity to copper. The ore of bismuth contain bismuth three oxide. Bismuth three oxide is insoluble in water and react with dilute acid to form aqueous solution of salt. So bismuth three oxide is insoluble but react with acid to form a soluble salt. The ore of bismuth contain no other compounds that are insoluble in water. That means if we have any other compound in the ore of bismuth, it will be soluble in water. And no other compound will react with acid. So only bismuth, three oxide, will react with acid. If we add water, we will remove all the soluble compound present in the ore. And only bismuth oxide will remain as insoluble. Then it can be reacted with hydrochloric acid. Describe how could you obtain a sample of bismuth metal starting from a large lump of the ore of bismuth. So, uh, because we have a large lump, first we have to crush the lump using mortar and pestle. Then we will add water to remove any soluble substances present in the ore. We will add more water to the powdered ore and we will mix. Then we will filter. The residue will be bismuth 3 oxide. And because bismuth 3 oxide is a metal oxide, so it's a basic oxide, it can react with hydrochloric acid. When bismuth 3 oxide reacts with hydrochloric acid, the uh, soluble salt form, of course, is bismuth chloride. So we will add hydrochloric acid to the solid residue in a beaker to form a solution of bismuth 3 chloride. Of course, because bismuth has the same reactivity as copper, so we can add more reactive metal like zinc, zinc metal, to the solution of bismuth 3 chloride in the beaker because zinc is more reactive, so it will displace bismuth and bismuth metal will be displaced, it will be as a solid and zinc will form <coughs> zinc chloride solution. So we can filter again to obtain the bismuth solid and we will wash it with distilled water and dried. That's how can we obtain a sample of bismuth metal from the ore of bismuth 3 oxide. Here we come to the end of our exam. Like the video and subscribe to the channel to receive all the updates. Thank you for watching. Wish you all best of luck.